just in North America in production, we have 13,000 plus deployables. Hey team, Sid here, and this is DevOps Deployed, the show where we take a look at DevOps and cloud infrastructure in the wild. Each week, I interview industry experts about their experience building software systems and the teams behind them. Today, I'm joined by Gotham Lau. Gotham is a tech lead at HubSpot, building the company's internal log aggregation and analytics systems. He's been building data and runtime infrastructure platforms for most of his career. Gotham also once won a HubSpot award for his style and signature hair swoop. There's even a Gotham emoji on the company Slack to prove it. Gotham, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I don't even know how you uh, how you got those last couple of bits of uh, bits of spicy information, but yeah, good good stuff. Okay, so before we dive in and talk about HubSpot and engineering uh, across the organization, I like to start each of these discussions with the same question. Gotham, what does the term DevOps mean to you? It's uh, it's a great question. It's uh, it's a hard question. Um, I would say you could arguably think of DevOps as any aspect of software development other than actually writing the software itself. So that includes the infrastructure to build, provision, deploy, run, test, and monitor your applications and your servers. Super cool. Yeah, I'd love to get that perspective from each of the guests because I think some people come at it from the development side, some people come at it from the operations side, uh, and people throw that term out without necessarily always being on the same page about, about what they're actually talking about. And so from there, can you just tell me a little bit about HubSpot and sort of what the company does, who the users are, that sort of thing. Yeah, HubSpot sells software that helps businesses grow better. What that means in concrete terms is, you know, we build software that allows you to run your sales organization, your marketing organization, and increasingly we are building software that allows you to run all aspects of your business. In sort of the most concrete sense, if you are a small to medium sized business, and you have you know, a couple of leads who might want to buy whatever you're selling, you need some way to track those leads. You need some way to see, I'm this far in the sales conversation with this lead. I have uh, these contacts that have some subscription-based revenue with us, and so I should check in with them to see if we're meeting their needs and if we're continuing to meet their needs. You need some set of software to help you track all that stuff. And at its core, that's what HubSpot provides. That's sort of the high level, really, of, of what HubSpot provides. But even beyond that, we end up with individual pieces of the product that are, that are kind of interesting and that you wouldn't think. So when you think of HubSpot as a marketing software company, that really hasn't been accurate for a while. One of the things that we have sold as a product for a long time is a CMS system on steroids, where we will actually host your website on our reliable infrastructure. In addition to that kind of thing, we also have more traditional marketing software tooling, such as software that allows you to manage your, your set of customer contacts that you have, or, or software that allows you to set up a forum where your own customers can reach out to you, or potential customers can reach out to you. It's, it's really a large suite of software that began as quote unquote marketing software, but now has really expanded into a situation where we want to help you run your entire business from top to bottom. Yeah, and it sounds like it, it helps both on the, the public facing external piece of it, as well as a lot of those internal systems around CRM and that sort of thing. And just in terms exactly of right. company history, I know it was founded in 2006, IPO'd in 2014, and there's, I believe, over 3,000 employees. So that just gives a sense of the scale of the operation. Yeah, 3,000 employees we have uh, on, our, on our platform engineering side alone. We actually have 150 employees just working on the internal platform that allows HubSpot product engineers to productively build the software that we sell to our external customers. So let's take that product org within HubSpot and talk about what it is, what it does, and, and how it enables the team, the, the broader engineering organization at HubSpot to operate more effectively. To kind of uh, step back and look at it from a 10,000 foot view first, at, at HubSpot, we have basically two sides of the engineering house. We have uh, the product engineering, side, which is, you know, building software for our actual, you know, external customers. And then we have the platform engineering side, which is very much its own distinct sort of organization, company, whatever you want to call it inside of HubSpot that builds products for the product engineering side. Now, a lot of companies, you know, say that they treat their platform as a, as a product. We really do walk the walk on this, though. We have a relatively formal customer provider relationship with the product engineering side. 
we have SLAs internally that we advertise to our customers, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the product engineers. We even build systems that allow the product engineering teams to promise SLAs to each other. So when you have the massive distributed microservices-based architecture that allows HubSpot to move so quickly to sort of iterate on these massive you know, pieces of software that we maintain, you, you have a situation where one team's backend applications can depend on three or four other teams' backend applications. That means that really you have this tree of services and each of those services need to be able to provide some guarantees to each other about availability, latency, error rates, and so on. By sort of treating all these internal engineering interactions as formal product customer provider relationships, we're able to operate at the scale that we do. That seems like at that scale, you need the formality that something like an SLA brings. Otherwise, all bets are off when when sort of the rubber meets the road. So it's really interesting to hear that. And just in terms of cloud provider, I believe it's primarily based on AWS with a a touch of GCP. Is that correct? That's accurate. Yeah. So, you know, the vast majority of our backend applications are are deployed in AWS, granted with many, many layers between the EC2 instance and the actual app server Mm -hmm. that we run and maintain. But yes, in terms of the raw compute nodes that we're on, the vast majority is AWS, a little bit of GCP. You you mentioned this massively microserviced architecture. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that plays out in terms of the systems that HubSpot is deploying? To give you an example right now, just in North America in production, we have 13,000 plus deployables. Now, what that means is some of those are web services. Some of those are, for example, queue consumers. Some of them are just workers. Some of them are cron jobs. Some of them are one-off, click the button, run this application or run this script style apps, Mm -hmm. but they are all deployables. Before I had joined HubSpot and I was in the interview process, I, I heard numbers like this and I was like, that's chaos. There's no way it can work. Most of the time, that is true. Right. That's, that's but, four services per employee, if, if anyone's doing the math. <laughs> right. Right. But as it turns out, we have built this universe of tooling internally that allows us not only to keep up with the proliferation of services, but really use it to our advantage. Just one tiny zoomed in example would be we have this, this SLA system that automatically computes over the log data set that's produced by all these applications and automatically assigns an SLA score for every single web service deployable. Mm. What that means is that we can make data-driven decisions um, despite this massive proliferation of, of individual uh, deployables. And then in terms of what is actually orchestrating the deployment of all of these things, what's on the back end there? Our sort of lowest level runtime infrastructure layer is actually Apache Mesos. This was definitely all stood up uh, pre-Kubernetes, but you know Mesos was and remains one of the large container orchestration server fleet management frameworks. Mesos on its own doesn't do very much. Mesos requires a scheduler, so you need a piece of code running that actually accepts offers of resources from Mesos and then launches applications on top of those resource offers. And for that, we use a homegrown Mesos scheduler called Singularity. Singularity is an open source piece of technology. I have contributed to it, so I'm biased, but I think it is an incredibly impressive piece of technology because it manages thousands and thousands of deployables and allows us to very reliably maintain approximately 80% utilization of memory and CPU across these hundreds and hundreds of EC2 servers that we have. The entire business effectively runs on Singularity and Mesos. It it does a lot of heavy lifting for us. My understanding, Mesos handles the clustering aspect and tying all these EC2 instances into an abstraction of here's compute and and memory and, and networking that you can access. And then the framework that you plug in, in this case, Singularity, I believe there's also Marathon, that handles the application scheduling and rollout and that that type of thing. That's exactly right. And to to folks watching, I would encourage you to check out and read the original paper where Mesos was described. I believe it's out of Berkeley. But the idea is that Mesos really turns the idea of a compute scheduler on its head. Whereas often you will say, you know, I have an application and I want to run it with three CPUs and and eight gigs of memory, do that. What Mesos does is it is constantly running on your server fleet. And what it does is it will constantly send you a set of resource offers. Every 
second, every few milliseconds, whatever, whatever your setup entails, it will send you a message saying, hey, I have an offer of resources from one of the hosts in your fleet. Here are you know, 16 CPUs, 24 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs of disk. And at any point you can take that resource offer and say, okay, Mezos, I'm going to ask you to launch this task, just a, a, a Linux process, mm -hmm. on that set of resource offers. By doing this kind of inversion of control where the cluster tells you what's available allows a number of interesting advantages around scheduling. So that's, that's kind of like the high level idea of Mesos. But I would definitely, I would definitely recommend folks uh, check out the, the paper. It's a very interesting piece of research. I'll, I'll grab a link to that and make sure to include it in the description so people can find that more easily. The other interesting thing that I found when looking at HubSpot is that despite having all of these microservices, and a lot of people use microservices as an excuse to be able to say, oh, we can write this, this microservice in Node, that we can write this one in Java, this one in Python. We can hire engineers who have expertise across all these different languages and, and plug them in at the right place. HubSpot really has embraced Java as the go-to language for writing all these services. Can you talk about that decision to focus as a, a monoglot organization? You can file this squarely in the category of things that allow us to manage this great proliferation of deployables. By really leaning into Java, we're able to do a number of things. The first thing that we can do is build our expertise and deploy that expertise in such a way that everybody gets the benefit of using vetted frameworks, libraries, technologies, and generally just the overall stack being vetted and being intended to all work together is kind of the benefit we get out of it. One way to think about it is it's almost the Apple approach to building a software platform. It is incredibly opinionated and it is all intended to work together. It does support other stuff. So one of the things that I have done at HubSpot is I've written a distributed real-time log tailor in Node.js. I went for Node.js because it just lends itself much better to the kind of web sockety, both web client and CLI client setup that that mm -hmm. particular problem like lends itself to. When I did that, it really was on me to make sure that what I was doing was going to be supported on the HubSpot platform. So I still had to deploy it. I had to write basically what we call build pack to build it on HubSpot's automated build system. Got I it. had to make sure that the deployment could be done via the standard deployment infrastructure that we have. In the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, 90% plus, product engineers building stuff on this, on this very vetted stack. This is a really huge topic, but let me give you just one of the examples of why this is great. So by shipping and maintaining Java-based client libraries, we can plumb through a lot of magic that would otherwise not be possible. Let me give you one specific example. We use Kafka quite a lot at HubSpot. One of the common things that, that happens at HubSpot is you have some web service as an entry point for some intent of work, right? Let's say you have like a queuing system, people can enqueue work with a hit to an entry point. From there, that piece of work might be enqueued onto a Kafka topic. From there, you might have a Kafka consumer that does some work, transforms the message somehow, puts it on another Kafka topic. You can have effectively DAGs, directed acyclic graphs of these pipelines. Because all Kafka usage at HubSpot goes through producer and consumer libraries, client libraries, owned and managed by HubSpot platform, we've actually been able to set up a system where the platform knows about these pipelines automatically. So we actually have a page on one of our internal product managed apps where you can see logical pipelines being automatically constructed by the fact that this client library knows, oh, I am writing to Kafka topic X. The producer on the other side of that topic mm -hmm. is another client library that says, oh, I am reading from topic X. We can then basically take all that raw information and reconstruct it into literally an automatically created boxes and arrows diagram on a web page that yeah. allows you to see um, the entire pipeline. That kind of magic would not be possible if we said, well, you can use a node, producer, consumer library, you can use Ruby, you can use whatever. Um, that's just one very zoomed in example of the kind of magic that is possible when you have a strongly vetted, opinionated tech stack that everybody uses. Otherwise, you'd have to implement each of those little hooks in every client library language, and it probably just exactly wouldn't, right. wouldn't be worth it at that point. Whereas by amortizing those costs across every client that is, is using it, you, you can gain those benefits. How does that come into play in the hiring process? Do you expect incoming engineers to already be proficient in Java, or are you willing to uh, work with incoming engineers who have expertise in 
other languages and other specialties, but then can map that onto Java. Yeah, so we absolutely hire for strong, smart engineers. We are not hiring specifically Java engineers. We are not hiring specifically SQL engineers. We're not hiring specifically HBase engineers necessarily. Obviously, depending on the role that you're going into and depending on the seniority level, there are some cases where we would want a specific uh, kinds of expertise. But in general, broadly speaking, the interview process is designed to avoid over-indexing on any particular hands-on keyboard skill. So in general, we want to see that you are able to, that you have built stuff and that you're able to build stuff in the language of your choice. In general, you know, we will conduct interviews in Java, but we absolutely give people the option of, of doing whatever. I'm a very, very deeply backend person. You know, I've been a platform engineer for most of my career at various companies. I actually did my um, interviewing in, I think, their Python or JavaScript just because it lends itself better to, to quickly implementing code yeah. uh, while lot, sitting lot in a room with an interviewer. Play. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, you don't have to go all public static void main when you're writing JS. We want to make sure that you are a, a smart person and that you can build stuff in the technology stack of your choice in your background. And that gives us confidence that, you know, you will be able to be productive on this strongly vetted opinion in a Java platform that we have internally. Continuing on the standardization and centralization theme, what is the process for bootstrapping a new service? So I come in as an engineer, I, kn I know we need this thing. What does that look like? I'm sure there's tons of tooling built up around it, but what can you walk me through what that process is and how some of this automation and systems that you've built up will enable rollout of a new, a new system or service? This is one of, I think, the most impressive aspects of our, uh, of our platform here. Not to bury the lead, the long and short of it is that the first piece of code you write in the process of bootstrapping a, a web service will be an endpoint handler. And that might not sound impressive to folks who maybe have not had the, the enterprise Java TM, TM, TM experience in the past, but I can assure you it is one of the most impressive things that we are able to do. Let me, uh, let me kind of take you through what it looks like in general, and then we can talk a little bit about what it looks like at HubSpot. So in general, when you bootstrap a Java application, you start with a blank dependencies file. One of the most popular Java dependency management technologies is a, a tool called Maven. So Maven allows you to write out a list of dependencies and their versions, and those will then get built into your executable package when you, when you build the app. Most of the time when you start a new Java application, you start with a blank dependencies file. You have to set the versions of all those things yourself. But here's the thing. Within a Java virtual machine, there is sort of a global namespace of classes. So what that means is if you have a fully qualified class name of, let's say, like com.apache.http.client, you can only have one copy of a class of a specific fully qualified name running in the JVM at any time. This is disastrous for most non-trivial software development. Uh, let me give an example for why. Let's say that you have a database framework that talks to MySQL, and let's mm -hmm. say you have a web framework that is how you actually accept web requests. Both of these things need to be able to talk JSON. So to do that, they both depend on the Jackson library. So Jackson is just a, a JSON parser for Java world. But here's the problem. In almost all cases, these two libraries will have their own dependency on Jackson pointing to different versions. So you know the, the database library might point to uh, Jackson v1.2, web framework library might point to Jackson 1.3. When these two dependency versions are packaged into the executable package at the same time, all hell breaks loose. And it will not break loose at build time, it will break loose at runtime. Because when the Java Virtual Machine's class loader says, I would like the class called com.apache.http.client, it is undefined which one it will actually load. Mm -hmm. But each of those libraries, the database and the web library, are expecting different stuff to be in that class. And so you run into what's called in Java world dependency hell. This is the process of bootstrapping a web service in Java in general. Remember, we, like the past five minutes of talking, like we haven't even gotten to doing any actual work yet. And all of that needs to happen before you have done any work for any useful work. What we have at HubSpot is what we call the parent POM. So POM in Maven speak stands for the project object model. It's just your list of dependencies. We have basically a top level parent list of dependency versions for every dependency used at HubSpot. This is a several thousand line file. 
And what it does is it sets those versions definitively for all applications running at HubSpot. This means that when you start a new Java project and you want to pick a dependency, you, all you do is name it. And the parent POM has already determined the set of mutually compatible dependency versions for the entire application. Th this enables a number of incredible things. This means if a team ships a library, you can just use that library without worrying about whether they are packaging different versions of dependencies than you are. Mm -hmm. It also means that we can do dynamic linking at runtime. So instead of packaging these, any non-trivial piece of software, I mean, Java is going to have many, 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 possibly hundreds of dependencies on other Java projects. Packaging that all together statically into the, the executable is what's called in Java world a fat jar. They can get into the hundreds of megabytes in size. What we are able to do is package and deploy thin jars. A thin jar is basically just your implementation code and then it's got pointers to your dependencies. So for every dependency at HubSpot, we upload one copy of each dependency to a central location on our Mesos hosts. Mm -hmm. The application code when it runs is just pointing to that single copy of the dependency on the host. Because all of the versions are predetermined, you only have to upload a single copy of that dep. Nice. So this massively reduces disk footprint of our dependencies on Mesos hosts. It also massively reduces the amount of traffic that we need to do to actually do the deploys that we do every day. That is the dependency piece of the situation. From there, we can do even better. So we've already made it so you don't have to figure out the mutually compatible dependency versions for your app, which is which can be a multi-day process depending on what you're bootstrapping. We've gotten rid of that. All you gotta do now is name your dependencies, but we can do one even better than that because if you're, if you're building a web service, we know what you're gonna need. We know that you're gonna need a web framework. We know that you're gonna need a database framework. We know that you're gonna need Juice at HubSpot, which is the Google maintained uh, dependency inf injection framework that we use. So we basically know, know the dependencies you're gonna need anyway. So we actually have an internal tool, just a simple CLI command allows you to auto-generate the depths that you will need for a web service mm -hmm. or a Kafka worker or a queue worker of uh, another kind um, or even like a, a CLI tool. All of this put together means that when you bootstrap a web service at HubSpot, you run a single CLI command. It creates your repo directory structure. It sets up your dependencies for you. And the first thing you have to do is write an endpoint handler. You are not even writing the code that says application.start, no public static void main mm -hmm. that you have to do yourself. It's all managed for you. Nice. And that is, again, if you are familiar with enterprise software development, unspeakably impressive. That sort of talks to the side of bootstrapping and getting up and running. Is there also a notion of automatically setting up things like monitoring and dashboards and alerting for these services as they come online? Again, uh, this, this goes back to why there is so much power in having a vetted, opinionated tech stack. Because everybody is using HubSpot platform managed client libraries to talk to, for example, MySQL, Kafka, HBase, and so on, we have metrics emission embedded in those client libraries. Mm. So whenever you talk to a MySQL database at HubSpot, or you talk to an HBase table at HubSpot, or you talk to a Kafka topic at HubSpot, these client libraries that we manage and maintain are automatically shipping metrics for your stuff. So the minute you deploy a new, let's say Kafka consumer, we immediately start automatically shipping metrics around, for example, the size of the Kafka queue, the distribution of work across the topic, um, the latency for production of messages to the topic. And all of this stuff is exposed in pre-built dashboards. So you can hop on to this dashboard you know, on the web and you can literally just plug in your deployable name and instantly you have a dashboard showing you all of the metrics for all of the data infrastructure that you're talking to, for example. The same thing applies to the HTTP side. So we have metrics emission embedded in our platform manage HTTP web frameworks. And so you automatically get dashboards showing you request volume, request queuing. The same thing applies to JVM metrics and garbage collection metrics. So that is another example of why combining vetted libraries with vetted infrastructure plumbing allows you to create this incredibly compelling experience for a developer where they can be as productive as possible without having to worry about a lot of those common details. That gives a really good idea of sort of this broader platform engineering 
organization and, and how you operate at HubSpot. Let's now dive in a little bit, a little bit more granular and talk about the team that you are on now, this logging infrastructure system that you're working on and building out and how some of these DevOps principles play out in the context of, of this more specific use case. In terms of logging infrastructure, just to give you a, a quick sense here. So we have, again, over 13,000 deployables of various kinds, services, workers, one-offs, cron jobs, and all of these applications are producing log data of various kinds. So they're producing just application logs, just in terms of if you do like a log.info, for mm -hmm. example, but then you also, so that's kind of discretionary logging, but then you also have access logs. You have logs around request and response times that powers our SLA system. So we somehow need to be able to get at these logs without having to SSH onto all these hosts. For some of our largest deployables, we have 60 instances of the web service. So if something goes wrong, how are you even gonna figure out which instance to look at? The answer is log aggregation. At HubSpot, we do approximately 50 terabytes of all source, new, fresh log data ingestion per day. We need a way to corral all that stuff. So my team builds software that ingests that data, stores it efficiently, both cost efficiently and size efficiently uh, in such a way that it is efficiently scannable. And then we also own the products like the web apps that actually allow developers to search these these data sets. So presumably in the past at some point there was some open source tool that you were using to handle a lot of this and then you reached a scale where that was no longer feasible. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and and this is like one of the most interesting things about being a HubSpot platform engineer today is that we are really right at the cusp of that point and we're really kind of in the middle of it where we are big enough that we have real hairy problems but we're not so big that we've solved all those problems ages ago. So we are really like, as a HubSpot platform engineer, I'm in the thick of it with my platform colleagues in, in solving these problems at scale. Let me give you an example. We are at the scale now where we break open source components that are for most medium to smaller uh, engineering shops are just standard issue, well-endorsed components. Mm -hmm. We used to use a log shipping agent for containerization frameworks like Kubernetes and Mesos, the official con community endorsed log shipping agent. Mm -hmm. And we found that at our scale, we have individual application instances. So not like all this, uh, the, the app server fleet of uh, a deployable, but you know an individual JVM task process doing so much web traffic that they were producing access logs at the rate of multiple megabytes per second. This is big data. Yeah. <laughs> we ran into a situation where during peak time, so basically between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time during weekdays, this log shipping agent would absolutely fall over. It would end up in a deadlock where it itself would stop producing any log output saying that anything was wrong or anything was right or anything was going on. Uh-oh. <laughs> and it started dropping up to 50% of the logs that it was supposed to be processing and uploading to S3, to cloud storage. This is not like a funky piece of two stars on GitHub, one-off project. This is the community endorsed log shipping agent for this use case. So we had to build our own setup. And so that's, I think, one really good example of the scale we're at, where we break a lot of these really community standard components. You detect that this is going on. You realize that hey, we, we need to make some change, whether that is reconfiguring what you currently have, building something new, evaluating other systems that are available. Can you walk me through what that process looks like from the time that now you've decided, okay, what we have is, is not working from design to how big a team you stand up to, to the point where you actually roll out something new to help solve it? One of the things that's really important is that this specifically is a good example of something that really touches every running application at HubSpot. We have a tree of dependencies. Some of them are closer to the root stuff that's gonna ship everywhere. Some of them are closer to the leaf nodes, stuff that's like pretty specific to one app or a couple of apps. Sure. Log emission sits pretty much literally at the root of our dependency tree at HubSpot. Every single application ships log emission code. And so what this means is when you're making a change like this, you have to be super, super careful. Yeah. Because when you, our, our build system is, is snapshot based. We don't have people pinning dependency versions themselves, as I already mentioned. 
we manage the snapshot version that, that everybody should be using for every dependency. What that means though is that it, as soon as you merge a change and that change is built, all other builds that depend on that module will now pull it in. Yep. So that means that if we merge a bad change to our log emission libraries, every app at HubSpot will start to pick it up and deploy it out. Rolling that back is while possible and we have the tooling to do it, it's a huge pain. It's a bad day. <laughs> it is a bad day. And so one aspect of doing a rollout of this scale is crazy amounts of testing. And log emission is an especially interesting problem because it is difficult to unit test. Now, for, for folks listening, you might be familiar with the idea of a unit test is, you know, you really want to test, we want to repeatedly test a single unit, ideally, of logic without depending on other stuff. Well, log emission is entirely dependent on other stuff. Log emission doesn't really make sense without the context of, for example, the deployed environment, the amount of traffic, work, IO, CPU, mem, whatever, that the app is doing. It doesn't make sense without the context of where are you actually writing these logs to. What it comes down to is, no matter how well you unit test log emission, you really don't see the problem, or problem exists, you don't see them until it is deployed and running. A great example of this is the system that we're talking about now, where we had this open source log shipping agent deployed, and you would only see the problem in very specific instances. That's why it took so long to track down. So it would be during this peak time, only when the host happened to be running enough apps that produce that multi-megabyte per second log volume mm -hmm. that would throw this log shipping agent into a deadlock. How are you going to unit test that? You don't. You have to uh, you know, test it live. So that's one aspect of rolling out a big change like this. The other piece of it is it's definitely not the case that we want to build everything internally. Invented here, not invented here syndrome, like that is, that's a real problem in the industry as we know. We are, we're definitely not in the business of saying like, all open source is crap, we're gonna do our own thing. But we do feel that when we run into a problem like this with an accepted like open source piece of uh, tooling, it really opens up the opportunity for us to say, okay, what can we do to make this very opinionated and very tightly fit to what HubSpot engineers need and what the HubSpot sort of platform and environment uh, demands. And that's exactly what we ended up with in a case like this. This log shipping agent had a bunch of extra features that ended up being more of a liability than, than a help. This log shipping agent allows you to do transformations and filtering and redaction and stuff. And we realized that like doing all that stuff on the host before, before shipping it, it up yeah. to cloud storage. Problem there is that's a whole lot of stuff going on right on the host. Instead of processing the log stream on the host before sending it off, why not treat it as a real log stream and process it with stream consumers, queue consumers? We kind of re-architected the system such that we do a very, very simple upload to S3 using a very, very simple uploader. Mm -hmm. And then we built basically all the functionality of the fancy log shipping agent as real deployed workers that basically read the stuff raw out of cloud storage do all the transforms, redactions, so on that we need to do, and then puts those logs in their final destination. These open source tools are designed to meet the broader need of the community, and maybe that's the 95th percentile or the 99th percentile, or even the, the 99 point something percentile. But once you get to the edge, you really need to start taking advantage of the unique use case that you have and what tricks you can play to capitalize on efficiency gains that you don't need, you didn't need those additional features on the, the log agent itself. And so you were able to take that and sort of build that into your own custom solution. That's exactly right. And this is why I say it's, it's almost like a, an Apple-ish approach to building an internal software platform where we very intentionally are not going to be everything to everyone. We know what we want to be based on what our internal engineers' needs are. Mm -hmm. And we can build very specifically towards those needs. And nothing more, nothing less. Can you talk me through the rollout? What did you have in place in terms of monitoring? Do you just flip the switch one morning and, and uh, watch the dashboards and say, here we go? What, what are you watching when that goes through? Obviously, the first step, like you already alluded to, is you have to be watching something. If you're not measuring it, then that kind of change can worm its way across our app server fleet, and we wouldn't even know it. So definitely monitoring in place. 
one of the key aspects of that is that we actually built basically a repeatable load testing pipeline for this log shipping setup. So we basically have a pipeline that generates log traffic at a rate of multiple megabytes per second. And it generates that load in such a way that every individual log line can be tracked and verified. We generate this load that is uniquely identifiable in each of its elements. Because that was one of the symptoms is it was just randomly dropping some percentage of logs. Exactly right. And it's not enough in a case like this to just do counts because when you're doing this much traffic, millions of requests, whatever, uh, in, in some time period before the problem, and it's still millions <laughs> after, but you're just missing stuff in the middle. Right. We, we built a testing pipeline that basically generates load at this high volume and then verifies every single log line got all the way through to the end. Um, so that was one of the pieces that we were watching. We set this pipeline up before. We had migrated everything else over, and then we, as we migrated, we watched the pipeline to make sure that it was, the tests effectively were still passing. That's one piece. Another piece is when I originally wrote the code for the library level piece of it, there, there were a couple changes here for this, for this migration. There was the on-host plumbing, so the actual uploads to cloud storage. There were changes in the server-side processing piece, so this worker that reads this raw data and does the fancy transformations. And then there were also, all the way back to the front of the line here, the, there were changes in the emission itself. So that, those were changes in, at, at the library level. The greatest risk here was the changes in the library level. Because if there's a bug in the worker that's doing these fancy transformations, well, that's fine. You just swap it pause up. the worker yeah. for a second, deploy a fix to it, unpause the worker, you're good to go. But as I said, once you merge the code change to the library level, immediately all new builds at HubSpot start pulling in these uh, changes. Rolling it back would have been, again, doable thanks to some cool tooling that we have, but still would have been a painful process. After writing the code to do this and testing it with live deploys, with live running applications, I actually went back and changed it so that we could configurably live switch between the old behavior for log emission and the new behavior. Obviously this is tricky because this is something that happens at application launch. When the application launches, immediately logging needs to start happening. So it's one of the first things that happens during the bootstrap of a running app server. So that's why I sort of originally wrote the code to just change over to the new functionality. As soon as people started pulling in the new build, they would be on the new functionality. If they wanted to go back to the old functionality, if we had a problem, we would have had to basically push a change to undo the merge. So instead, I, I changed the code so that basically we have Every HubSpot JVM now ships with both kinds of log emission behavior in place. And with a literal configuration switch, we can flip between the two behaviors. Thankfully, we flipped it forward about a week ago and have not had to flip it back. Nice. That's awesome. So, yeah, so that's this concept of feature flags. A lot of, a lot of times people use it on the front end of like what design right. people are getting. But yeah, that's interesting having it all the way down, initial app boot up. Are there any major lessons that you've learned in your career building and operating these systems uh, at HubSpot and elsewhere that you would share to others in the field, perhaps a, an engineer at a company who's trying to enable their systems to scale to the degree that, that someone like HubSpot has? So a couple things I would mention. When I first joined HubSpot, I was a little bit apprehensive about this whole idea of like a vetted, a very vetted platform stack where you know, if you really, really have a good case for going off on your own and doing an off stack thing, you can. But in the vast majority of cases, we really want you to stay on this like vetted stack. I'm very much, uh, I've, I've worked on like R&D teams, worked on like labs style teams. I'm very much like, a play with new stuff as much and as often as you can kind of person and still am. But I have to say that I am completely transformed on the idea of a vetted platform stack for an organization that is the scale of HubSpot. Before HubSpot, I worked at companies where really each team was in charge of its own software from the level of an empty repository. Mm -hmm. you would, uh, like I said, you would have to pick your own dependency version. If you want to go Node, you can go Node. If you want to do something off in Ruby, you can do that. If you want to do something off in Rust, you can do that. And it was great for the raw learning aspect of, the, of, of my kind of day-to-day, -day, but it is beyond a certain size of organization and company, it really becomes a little bit of a hellscape. So I would say that, you know, one thing that I definitely have learned is that if you want to really focus on developer productivity, which is something that should be a huge factor in the mind of anybody who wants to build uh, a large software development organization, mm -hmm. 
making deliberate early on decisions about the common foundational problems of the engineering org and how to solve those once definitively for everybody should be top of mind. Obviously, this is a balancing act. If I were running a startup today, I probably wouldn't start by writing a mesoscheduler, and neither did we. But I think we struck a really good balance of deciding that when we got to a certain size saying, okay, we can no longer start from scratch every time on every team when we want to build something new. Yeah. I would just encourage everybody to, as you're, as you're building software teams, think deliberately and think early on about at what point are the foundational problems becoming so common and taking up so much of your developer productivity and human effort and time that it's time to step back and solve these problems once definitively for everybody. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's great advice. Is there anything on the, the roadmap for you and your team in the next quarter, six months, year that you can share that you're particularly excited about? This sort of big launch that we just did obviously represents a major bug fix on a specific problem, which was the dropping logs for high volume scenarios. But what it really gives us is a foundation to build on top of. So, you know, now that we have tested reliable log shipping, even for these insane multi megabyte per second emission scenarios, we can really build on top of that and get fancier at the feature level and at sort of the log searching app UI product level yeah. with confidence that whatever features we build on top of this, it's not going to crumble at the foundational level. One specific example that we're very excited about is building a homegrown distributed tracing system at HubSpot. So what that means in practice is, like I said, you have these effectively pipelines of deployables at HubSpot. So you might have web service that serves as an entry point, somebody hits it, the web service produces a message to a Kafka topic. That uh, topic is consumed by a worker that then hits two other web services to do some aggregation, mm -hmm. produces a message onward elsewhere. You know, I've already mentioned that we have, because of our sort of client library tooling, we are able to build a logical understanding of pipelines involving multiple deployables. What we would love to do now is allow people to track an individual piece of work through the entire pipeline. Mm -hmm. That is based on the plumbing we have now between this understanding of logical pipelines and this reliable high volume log shipping pipeline. We can put those two together and create effectively a distributed tracing system that allows you to say, I noticed that one of my deployables threw an exception for the piece of work with ID X. I can then track ID X throughout the logical pipeline that constitutes that system. And I can see, did any of the other deployables in the pipeline throw an exception or note anything weird about this, this piece of work? And again, there are, um, there are open source technologies and there are stuff, there's stuff you can buy that does that. But again, by building on the homegrown stuff on the logging side and on the, the client library side, by building on top of that homegrown plumbing, we can do something that is much, A, cheaper, B, better designed for HubSpot engineer needs, and overall avoids any additional cruft that we would have to pay for but wouldn't necessarily need in an out-of-the-box tracing solution. I would characterize that as like adding a layer of observability on top of the logging and, and monitoring systems that you've already got. That is exactly right. Awesome. So I think that concludes the set of questions that I wanted to cover with you today, Gotham. Uh, if people want to learn more about what we discussed and how engineering operates within the HubSpot organization, where would you suggest they look? Yeah, I would definitely recommend that folks check out our product and engineering blog. We talk a lot about some of the, go into detail about some of this stuff that I touched on today. One of the coolest articles on there talks about how we actually do dependency management on our Mesos servers for our job applications. Would very much recommend that you check that out. Nice. Awesome. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks. Mm -hmm.